turn in our Bibles to Hebrews 12. Still in the first three verses. And we'll finish verse 3 tonight. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word and truly look at Jesus, the Logos, the word. And may our hearts be stayed on thee so that we will not grow weary and lose heart in this devil's world, a place of suffering and persecution. But may we look at this in light of eternity and the great great glory of resurrection that awaits us and the kingdom that will come. So, Lord, help us to persevere and have endurance during this time in which we are here to bring glory to you. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Well, verse 2, by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or finisher of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now verse 3 It says, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So let's look at this first word I want to focus on. I think it's very important because we have the word consider. Most of you have that, right, in your Bible translation. Very common in English uh, to translate this Greek in such a way. But the word is analogizomai. Now, this word is from the word logizomai, logizomai, which means to reckon, sometimes to impute, like imputed righteousness from Romans 4. That's this word. But it can also mean to consider or think. So, analogizomai, the compound, means to consider accurately, to think intently, or to ponder deeply. So, you can already see that the spiritual life is a thinking man's game, right? Right? you got to know, you got to have Scripture in your heart, and you have to know it well and consider it. Um, you need to consider the Scripture and learn it accurately to apply it correctly. Now, the form of this verb, it's an imperative mood, and you all know what that is. When you find a Greek verb in the imperative, it's a command. So, people say, well, I want to obey the commands of Jesus. Well, this is one you have to obey. And usually it's like, well, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. Well, obey those, but you got to do this one too. So we're actually commanded to consider or ponder and think intently about our Lord Jesus Christ and the circumstances of His life during the incarnation. Again, if you don't know the Bible and the truths related to His life, this will be impossible to do. You won't have anything to draw on. So we got to know Jesus, we need to know Christology and all the aspects of that, but clearly we, we have to know what He went through during His incarnation. Remember what Jesus said in John 8, and this was to believers, okay, it wasn't to unbelievers, if you read the, the text carefully, but Jesus says to His disciples, those who had believed in Him, it says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. It really will free you. Uh, If you understand truth in the challenges and struggles you go through, the truth will deliver you. That's usually quoted that he said it to the unbeliever. If they believe the gospel, they'll be saved. But that's not what he's saying since he addressed it to those who had believed in him. So we need to consider Jesus. Namely, what is he called? The one who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. So what hostility from sinful opposition did Jesus endure? Well, wouldn't you argue from birth to death he received opposition? Um, So let's start with his birth. Turn with me to Revelation 12. And really, Revelation 12, 1 through 5, it's a passage that really summarizes the incarnation. Um, You'll see there's a lot going on in it. But you'll definitely see his birth, and then he's taken up to heaven, so he's already been glorified. 
We hadn't been in Revelation 12 in a while, so. So Revelation 12, 1 says, A great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown, a crown of 12 stars. So the woman in context is Israel, the nation. And the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you want to see the Old Testament component to this, you just read Genesis 37 and Joseph's dream that describes similar imagery. So clearly... People are trying to say, well, who's the woman? Well, it's the whole nation Israel. So Genesis 37 is the key. And notice in verse 2, she, the woman, Israel, was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. So is this Israel or Mary? Yeah, because who's going to bring forth the Messiah but the nation Israel? That was the promise through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons and one was Judah. The king will come from Judah, specifically that line. And what tribe was Mary from? Judah. So she'll be the actual woman in the line of Judah, in the line of David, that will bring forth the child. So verse 3, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. So we know from context, the red dragon is Satan. Um, I think he's described a little bit later in the chapter. I think it's 12.9. Uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong there. Is 12.9 giving all the names? The ancient serpent, the devil, Satan. and So the, the red dragon is Satan. So verse 4 It says, his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. I think this describes the one-third of the fallen angels that followed Satan and in his unholy rebellion. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. So the woman in the context here is Israel, who would bring forth the Messiah. You can see this about Israel in Romans 9, 3 through 5. Because not only were they given the promises and the covenants, and, but the Messiah would come through that nation. But Mary, the, the, the woman Mary in the line of Judah, an Israelite woman from the tribe of Judah, she would actually physically give birth to Jesus. You can see this in the genealogy of Matthew 1, with Satan being interested in destroying Christ from his birth. Think about it. He could never destroy Israel. All 12 tribes were in existence when Jesus came. And now that he couldn't destroy Israel, uh, Mary gives birth to the child. So what's he going to do for the rest of that child's life? Try to destroy him early on all the way through. So Jesus began his public ministry at age 30, but was there any persecution from age 1 to up to that point? Of course. So Revelation 12, 5, notice how it's going to jump to his ascension. In session. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. So he's a king in the line of David. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. So he would ascend to heaven and seat, be seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We just saw that at, in Hebrews 12. So the Messiah would receive opposition from his birth until the Lord brought him safely into the presence of himself at the end of the first advent. So now I'll go to Matthew 2. I'm just trying to find some persecution early in his life. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2. This is a text dealing with the persecution by sinners against himself after his birth. So the first part of the chapter is when the Magi come, right? These are wise men from the east. So what area are they coming from? 
Mesopotamia, between the rivers. That's what Mesopotamia means, Shinar. Um, it's Babylon. And so remember Balaam gives those four oracles, and they're prophetic. And he says in Numbers 24, 17, a, a scepter and a star will come from Israel. So Balaam reveals that the Messiah will be a king, and he'll come from the nation Israel. Well, Balaam is eventually killed, but he takes the prophecy back to Mesopotamia. And then he's killed, but do you think they held on to that prophecy? Yeah. So wise men, what book do they show up in? Daniel. They're still around, and they're in that area. And um, so they see the star in the east when they come to worship the king, right? How would they have known about that? A star will come from Israel, the Balaam oracles that were taken there. And those were preserved all those centuries, and now they know we've come to worship the king. So they bring gold, which is a gift worthy of a king. They bring, what else did they bring? Frankincense, an incense for worship. And then what else? Myrrh, a burial spice. Why would you bring a burial spice to a child uh, after he's born? Because this child's destined for sacrifice. And they know that. How would they know from Daniel? Well, they'd know he's a king because Daniel too. The kingdom of Messiah will replace the kingdoms of man. Um, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, the father, the ancient of days, will give the kingdom to the king, to the Messiah. But how do you know he's going to die in Daniel? I'm kind of testing you tonight. Dan yeah, Daniel 9. Uh, in 9, 24 through 27, one of the verses says, um, after a certain time period, uh, year 483 out of the 490 years. He said, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. So that means he's going to die. So they come at the right time as according to Scripture. So in verse 13, now when they had gone, that's the Magi, after they come to worship the king, they leave. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him, which I think is a satanic attack. Now, Satan wanted to devour the child from his birth. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night, and he left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So he quotes Hosea 11.1. There's some complexities with why he would do that since that was not a prophecy. It was actually looking back to when Israel left Egypt earlier, but the Lord does uh, send Jesus to Egypt with his parents to deliver him and then will eventually bring him back. Now, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, because the Magi just basically disappear off his map. And from what I understand, in the ancient world, they had a pretty good tracking system of people coming in and out of the city. And they, they, he can't find them anymore. You think God had a little bit to do with that <laughs> and to protect them? I think so. So when he saw that he was tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So he listens to them. In other words, he just wants to find out Hey, so this king is born. He's on earth now. Well, he has to be less than two years old. So what does this evil man do, just like Satan in his desperation, to kill one child, the Messiah, he's going to kill every ch boy under two years old in the whole region. And my question is, I don't care if you're following orders from a superior. How can anyone saddle up with a sword and go kill all these boys? When do you say, no, I'm sorry, I'll do anything. You just kill me. I'm not doing that. So he kills all these children, and where's Jesus? He's not even there. He's in Egypt. So what a waste. So then what was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Um, it says, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel was is weeping for her children. Now, Rachel was way before the time of Jeremiah, right? So was this literal Rachel, the, the wife of uh, 
Jacob? No, it represents Israel women. And so just like in Jeremiah's time when kids were being killed and there was weeping, here we go again. Um, so this wasn't a prophecy of what was going to happen. It's a similarity just to show once again there's great distress in Israel and Jewish women are weeping for their children. Uh, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. So verse 19, when Herod died, behold, an, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream to Joseph and said, get up and take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left the region for Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth. That kind of threw the Jews a little bit because um, he wasn't born in Nazareth. He was born, according to prophecy, in Bethlehem because Micah 5.2 said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So we really don't have a lot of information about the childhood of Jesus. We have a little bit in Luke 2, you know, when he's in the temple as a young boy talking to the Jewish leaders and blowing their minds, if you will. I think that's in the Greek, or how much he knew. Well, he's the Son of God. So I always have wondered over the years, what hostility was against him that wasn't revealed in Scripture? How much during his young life, how much uh, up to the time when he began his public ministry, and what's, what happened to him during those three years of public ministry that the Bible doesn't even record? We have what we need to know in the four Gospels. But as John says at the end of John, if everything was written about Jesus in the books, the world couldn't contain him. Um, so a lot more had happened in his life, and I'm sure Satan worked overtime to get rid of the Lord and not let him go to the cross. So he goes to the cross, he goes back to heaven, and now he's trying to block the second advent. How is he going to do that? Destroy Israel. And we're all wringing our hands. What's going on with Israel? Why are they under attack? Because if God comes back and there's no Israel to return to, then he violated his word because he he's in covenant with them. And now Satan will say, you are a liar. You couldn't do what you said you were going to do. But we know from prophecy that will not be the case. So Jesus continued to receive attacks from Satan, hostility by sinners against himself, uh, Matthew 4 and Luke 4, you have the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness for those 40 days. Jesus received constant hostility from the Jewish people, from the religious leaders. Remember John 8, 12 and his um, Jesus is the light of the world discourse? Well, in 8, 12 through 8, 59, he's dealing with a hostile crowd of Jews. And they're calling him the devil, you have a demon in you and all this stuff and of course, he's going back pretty aggressively with them. And he said, if you were Abraham's children, which you're not, you're children of the devil, John 8, 44. But if you were Abraham's children, you wouldn't be seeking to kill me because Abraham never did that. And they love that kind of stuff. So at the end of this in John 8, 56, after this hostile back and forth, he said to the Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not even yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? What, Abraham's, what, 2000 B.C.? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, ego eimi, which is Greek, I am. So he basically is saying, I'm the Lord from the time of Moses when I met with him on the mountain. And he asked, who are you in Exodus 3? And he goes, tell him I am sent you. So Yahweh is the great I am, and Jesus claims that name to claim deity. And then in verse 59, persecution. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus himself hid himself and went out of the temple. So this constant divine deliverance, because it was not his time. He's delivered as a boy through those circumstances in Egypt, and God just keeps protecting him. So, Matthew, I'm just giving you a few more. We could go on for days on this. 
But Matthew 16, 21, it says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Matthew 26, 3 and 4, The chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. Even Satan entered Judas so that Judas would betray him for those 30 pieces of silver over to the religious leaders and religious authorities. And Jesus obviously allowed that to happen. It was all part of God's plan. It, the people at his trial continually yelled, crucify him, crucify him in Luke 23. The Romans tortured him scourged him and crucified him under the order of Pontius Pilate. So he went through terrible physical suffering beyond any of us will ever understand. Not to mention the cross and all that and what that entailed. So back to our text, the purpose for focusing intently on Jesus is, notice, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart or grow weary in your souls. So you have a so that, do you have that? So that. Well, in Greek, that's a purpose clause. It introduces one. So it's a, there's a purpose for which we're to focus on Jesus and the things that he went through. So if we don't do this, we're going to miss something. But if we do, it's so that we won't grow weary and lose heart. So let's look at the two words. They're on the slide. The first word is, first words are grow weary. But it's one Greek word, komno. Komno means to grow weary, to be weary, or to be sick. Now, the question is, does it include physical sickness, disease? Um, it's possible, but the only, does anyone know the only other place this word shows up in the New Testament? James 5. Remember, if any one of you is sick, let him call for the elders, and they'll, they'll pray over you. Um, notice it says there, not that elders can't show up somewhere and pray for somebody. Um, sometimes it's important to give them a phone call and say, can we come by? But that says the Christian is to call for the elders if he's weary or sick. I don't think it's physical sickness. The context of James, all five chapters, is enduring during, endure during trials. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. First chapter. Chapter 5 has a whole section on be patient during trials, endure to the end. And if you, get, if you grow weary, call for the leadership of the church and they'll pray for you. Hey, praying for physical sickness, we will do that. But you rarely get somebody calling you saying, I need some spiritual encouragement. Can you pray for me? And that's what we ought to be. And it tells me the congregation should not be shy about that. It's part of your responsibility. Or go to somebody. I mean, hopefully, if you have a local church you belong to, go to them. But maybe you have a good friend that could be uh, spiritually helpful to you. Again, I'm not saying you don't pray for sick people, physically sick. But I think contextually, we got two verses that I think are deal dealing with spiritual weariness in the midst of trial. And then he says, so you won't grow weary and then lose heart. It's the Greek word el ekluo. Ekluo means to become extremely weary, to collapse in weariness or be discouraged. I think it's more of an internal discouragement. To give up based on discouragement. When I first took this church, somebody told me, said, David, beware of this. Satan will use discouragement on you like nothing else. It's not physical disease, it's discouragement. He'll use it on all of us if he can, because some people just give up. So this whole phrase could be translated literally, so that you will not grow weary in your souls and give up, or become discouraged and give up. So persecution and opposition for following Christ can bring a Christian to spiritual despondency and spiritual weariness. We just give up. Had enough. Uh, I remember uh, after I graduated college, I wasn't a Christian until age 26, so it wasn't too much longer after that I came to Christ. And a guy I knew in college was a Christian, and I watched him go through a lot of persecution just simply because he was a Christian. 
<laughs> and if there were Christians on that campus, I didn't know it because none of them I knew were following Jesus. Now, you, they could have just been grieving the Spirit, right? But they were really giving him a hard time, and I'm kind of like, leave him alone. I don't have a beef with him just because he's a Christian. He's a nice guy. But we were talking after I con- converted to Christ, and he was all excited about that. He goes, you know, you graduated a year after, or a year before me, so I'm still on the campus for a year. And I got, here's how he said it, I got so tired of going against the grain of this world that I joined it. I just couldn't take it anymore. He was really out, way outnumbered. But what does Jesus say about being outnumbered? So what? You got me on your side, you got the greatest. But he did give up, and I understand that. And then, so he quits walking with the Lord because of the opposition and just blended with the world. It wasn't like he just quit walking with Christ. He said, I went into the world and tried what they're doing. He said, when I realized I wasn't missing anything, I eventually came back to the Lord. And that was a good move. A lot of guys do that. They really, got, and God will let that fishing line out a long time. I'll let you run with this until you want to come back because you're going to want to come back. When this doesn't work out for you, I'll be here. So that's what happened with him, and I think it happens all the time. So the remedy revealed in the Scripture in order to strengthen and stabilize us to, is to focus on Christ, not ourselves and the problems and persecutions of life. So if we don't maintain a daily walk with Jesus, we'll become spiritually worn out, depressed, and discouraged and grow faint in our walk with the Lord. Here's something else I want to point out. The text does not say that focusing on Christ will eliminate all the external trials and tribulations of the world, does it? You'll hear people do that. If you come to Jesus, everything will be perfect. You come to Jesus, you're going to be healthy and wealthy. And some people say, no, I came to Jesus. I got real physically sick. I had all these trials and tribulations. The world's coming after me. Um, Well, I said, that wasn't true what they said. I mean, God may make you wealthy. You might be physically healthy. I don't know. But a lot of Christians go through a lot of suffering, and it has nothing to do with their sin. It's because they've chosen to walk with the Lord, and He's using it for their testing. Didn't Jesus say these words? John 16, 33, These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Notice he doesn't say, just believe in me and you'll never come under trial. No, in the world you have tribulation, but notice the focus. But take courage, I, singular, I have overcome the world. In other words, focus on me. Because he's getting ready to send those disciples out into the inner advent period, which will be a time of suffering. Did any of the disciples or apostles bypass suffering? None of them did. And it was all Attacks, spiritual attack, even to death. So if we focus on Christ, we can be internally, remember, internally stable in our walk with God in the midst of the external pressures of life. You can just let that stress inside. You don't have to. But when we start to collapse internally in the soul, it's an indication that we've taken our focus off Christ and got it on something else. So the flesh starts to dominate us. We're not walking by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that leads to spiritual failure, misery, and depression. So what do you do if that happens? Well, the Bible says you don't get re-saved. You confess your sins to the Lord, no matter how long it's been. Confess your sins to the Lord and continue to abide in fellowship with God. As Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As you learn and apply the word by means of the Holy Spirit. Remember, walk by the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.16. So believers are called to righteously identify with Christ in the midst of unjust suffering. Acts 14, 21 and 22. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, so people come to faith and they start following the Lord, They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's encouragement to tell you through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. 
That's how they saw it. Look, this is part of the terrain, but just continue in the faith, which is the Word of God, and the reminder of the tribulations we go through until the kingdom finally comes. Um, go to 2 Thessalonians 1. The Thessalonian church was actually a church that really did well early on in their walk with God. Not that they were without any problem, but they, they did well. So verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each, each of you toward one another grows ever greater. So the, the fruit of the Spirit is love and they're continuing to grow in that. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So Paul is seeing them do what the book of Hebrews is calling us to do. And the apostles are sharing that with other churches because they're going through it, going through it as well. <clears throat> and then one verse, which is very helpful here. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might be or will be persecuted. And that's why a lot of Christians won't walk with Jesus, like my friend for a while. If I just blend in, everyone will leave me alone. And that's kind of what was happening in Hebrews. They were defecting to just avoid the cultural pressure. So rather than rejecting the value of suffering for Christ, we're to actually embrace this purpose for which we're called. Now go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll start at verse 20 and go through... 25. So Peter tells his believing audience, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? So if you endure because you're walking in sin and you're attacked for that, that means nothing. But if when you do what is right, so you're, doing, you're walking righteously with God and suffer for that, and you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So clearly you're being persecuted for, for unjust suffering. Um, if you sin and are persecuted, that's deserved. <laughs> And then verse 21, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. So what purpose were believers called in this text? Suffering and reflection of Christ. I mean, we're not going to suffer to the same degree in a lot of ways, but we do need to see what he went through and then walk in those steps and obey him. So I'd clarify, suffering righteously in represent, representation of Christ in the midst of unjust suffering. And then he goes on to describe Jesus, who committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. So Jesus, the sinless Son of God, died at the hands of unjust sinners. Ah, oh, there's that hostility by sinners against himself. And while being reviled, he didn't revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. 
which would be God the Father, the righteous judge. So no retaliation, quite the opposite. I mean, even when he's on the cross, what did he say to those in the crowd? Father, forgive them? Is that what you would have said? I hope. Well, I'm not the son of God. I can't do that. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Only Jesus could say that. Well, you want to say that, but who do we have that said the same thing as a human being like us? Stephen. (laughs) So we do have an illustration of somebody dying for the faith and saying basically the same thing. So in Acts 7, after Peter goes through this, I'm sorry, Stephen goes through this incredibly long sermon of Old Testament history to show that Jesus is ultimately the Messiah they killed. Well, they were doing okay until he said, you killed him. Um, so they start to stone Stephen as he called on the Lord. See, calling on the name of the Lord isn't getting saved when for an unbeliever calling on him. It's always a believer calling on the Lord for help. You're going to him for in a time of need. So they kept on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, because he knows he's going to the Lord. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep or died. Well, didn't Jesus say that? He said that at the cross. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. So 1 Peter 2.24, also speaking of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness For by his wound you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Again, a lot in the Bible about suffering unjustly for the Lord. And Peter even says we were called for this. And if we do it well, it brings glory to the Lord. So did Jesus' suffering ever come to an end? Of course it did. Acts 1-3, when he appears to the, to the disciples after his resurrection. So he says, it says, to these, he also presented himself alive after his, after his suffering. It's gone now. He's already died. He's gone into the grave. He's resurrected. He's on earth for 40 days preaching the kingdom of God. And now his suffering is over and he's about to return to the Father. Which he does. And then one day he's going to return and can completely remove our suffering as well when we get resurrected. So our temporary suffering will also come to an end when we're resurrected in Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we don't lose heart, but though, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So our bodies may be going away and winding down, but we don't lose heart because of what's going on through the Holy Spirit to the inner man. And then he says, 17 and 18, I quoted a lot, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So if you keep your eyes focused on Jesus and focused on the future, Uh, where we're heading when he returns, that takes the sting off of affliction because you realize this is not going to go on forever. So momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So Jesus went through affliction because why? What was he looking for that he knew was coming? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And I showed you last week, I think the joy was the joy of the kingdom that he would rule. So they may kill him and he may die for the sins of the world, but he's going to resurrect and then rule a kingdom in glory. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then Revelation 21, 4, when we get to the eternal state after the millennium, the Lord will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death 
There'll no longer be any mourning, crying, or pain. The first things have passed away. And again, that takes the sting off the present, knowing that that's going to be an eternal joy and eternal glory with no more sin. So let's go back and review a little bit why we're in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, and what was the context of this. Remember, the audience of Hebrews, they were believers. They were at one time really walking well with Christ in the midst of cultural persecution, but they started a backslide. And again, they were giving up because of the persecution. So go to Hebrews 10. Let's just back up to verse 32. So Hebrews 10.32, the writer says, but remember the former days, it's not happening now, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. I think being enlightened is when they came to the Lord. So they were enduring conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. So they're even identifying with their brothers in suffering and helping them. You showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. Why, though? Because they knew that they had something for themselves, namely a better possession and a lasting one. Isn't that kind of looking at the momentary light affliction as you compare it with the eternal weight of glory that comes in the future? He says, therefore, don't throw away your confidence. It has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. So then he quotes Old Testament. He says, For yet in a little while he who is coming will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, God says, My soul will have no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who shrink back to ruin, but those of faith to the preserving of the life. So then what does he do? goes to chapter 11, and he writes a whole chapter on these great examples of faith and times of difficulty from Old Testament saints to encourage his audience, and we've looked at that verse by verse. And then we'll close with where we started. Therefore, so he's coming kind of out of chapter 11 and what he said in chapter 10, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that's all those in the hall of faith from chapter 11, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, the throne of God. For consider Him who has endured such hostility by sinners against Himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And people say, well, that's pretty easy to read, a little bit more difficult to do. But guys, I don't have a second option here. And a lot of Christians say, well, I'll find another way. There's got to be something easier than this. No, there's one spiritual life, and God has laid out how to run the race, how to walk the, the walk. We have to follow Him. And if it's not working, it's because something we're doing. So just keep your focus on Christ through His Word. And do it to the end of your life. And when you fail, recover as God tells you to recover before Him and just continue abiding on. <clears throat> so next week, we'll, I'm going to do a little addendum to this, and then we'll start verse 4 and the discipline of God that will follow in the next several verses. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. Uh, we thank you that you did send your son who did go to the cross and bear our sins, who did go into the grave and raise from the dead. And we thank you that the gospel and the eternal life received by believing it is just simply a free gift. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We don't work for it. We believe in Jesus Christ and we are saved. But now after bec uh, becoming Christians and saved from the penalty of sin, we have a lot to deal with in this life as you have left us here to glorify you in our representation of you. 
So, Lord, you've given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ to do so. And may we actively and thoughtfully avail ourselves to all of this so that we won't grow weary and lose heart, but most of all, bring you the glory. In Jesus we pray. Amen.